An Analysis of Sailing to Byzantium by William Butler Yeats Sailing to Byzantium That is no country for old men, the young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song, the salmon falls, the mackerel crowded seas, fish, flesh or fowl, commend all summer long, whatever is begotten, born and dies, caught in that sensual music, all neglect, monuments of an ageing intellect. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless soul clap its hands and sing and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. Nor is there singing school but studying monuments of its own magnificence, and therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. O sages standing in God's holy fire, as in the gold mosaic of a wall, come from the holy fire, burn in a gyre, and be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away, sick with desire, and fastened to a dying animal. It knows not what it is, and gather me into the artifice of eternity. Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing, but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enamelling to keep a drowsy emperor awake or set upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. Well, I have to admit that this is one of my favourite poems of the 20th century. It's quite dense with meaning, not necessarily easy, but it was T.S. Eliot that said, great poetry communicates itself as great poetry before one is able to even understand or appreciate the meaning in a deep sense, just the music and the drama of the words communicates itself and we know it's great poetry. I think this is like that. It was also T.S. Eliot who said that Yeats was the greatest poet of the 20th century by virtue of his last poems, those probably written, written from when he was in his late 50s and to the end of his life, and this is one of those. This is very unusual. Usually poets and other creative artists actually decline in their later years. We cannot think of many artists who improved or even maintained their level. Perhaps Giuseppe Verdi in music, uh, writing his masterpiece Falstaff at the age of over 80. But it's very unusual, and in this case, <coughs> excuse me, in this case, Yeats wrote most of his best poetry after he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. So this is really quite amazing. Um, how do you start to talk about a poem like this? Uh, well, you know, a few broad, very broad brush strokes. It's about, it's about what happens to creative artists and poets in particular when they get old. Poets are supposed to be young men interested in emotional matters like love and uh, romance. However, can a, a poet continue to be a poet as he gets older, as he or she gets older? The answer seems to be yes here, but it's a very long and tortuous argument. Uh, in this case, usually I speak about the, the structure of the poem last, but in this case, and in Yeats's uh, 
case in general, really, I think it's worth saying something from the beginning about the structure. Yeats is not modern, like Eliot or Pound was modern for the 20th century. He used traditional forms and meters. However, he knew that he had to update these traditional forms. He was competing with uh, <coughs> modern artists like Pound and Eliot, and he knew that he had to do something different. It couldn't be just the same old meters. And what he did, what he went for, was very fluid line and uh, something that we saw when we looked at No Second Troy is even more clear here. And that's the way in which Yeats uses run-on lines the whole time. And uh, the sense, the meaning, is not complete at the end of a line. It runs on to the next line. This is very unusual for tradition people who poets who write in traditional meters, Shakespeare's sonnets, for example. There is a kind of little termination at the end of every line. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. So at the end of every line, there is a kind of little mini conclusion. But this is not like that. This this is a, a very fluid line which is moving on all the time. And sometimes uh, the lines end in a very strange way. So let's, let's look at the first stanza from this point of view. It begins, That is no country for old men. Full stop. The young. Now this is the end of the line, that's ten syllables, I think. That is no country for old men. The young. So it, it, it's, it's very strange from a traditional point of view. No poet from the past would have ended a, a line like, like that. The young. And then it continues on the next line. The young in one another's arms. Birds in the trees. So... It's got this sense of uneasiness about it, a kind of uh, a kind of dislocated sense of uh, uneasiness, and you're never quite sure where the emphasis is going to be placed or what you should be looking for. Um, but usually, there is some point to to why he has used a particular word to to finish a line, the young. So that first line is, that is no country for old men, full stop. The young. The young is in contrast to the old men, and uh, it's, it's what's new. The old men are going, the young are coming, and there is a reason for emphasizing that word young, which is uh, a noun here, but uh, in traditional poetry it would be very unusual to end the line in this incomplete way. It's very difficult to say what the the meter is at the beginning because it's 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 going everywhere. That is no country for old men. It seemed a kind of dactyle. That is, or yeah, that is no country for old men. The young. That's changing, and then later it seems to settle down into a kind of iambic pentameter. But it's a very uneasy iambic pentameter. Remember, remember, the iambic is a stressed and unstressed syllable, making a poetic unit or a, a foot. So, it's iambic, but it's a very, it's a very uh, unusual kind of iambic, which is moving between different meters, begins in a kind of dactylic way, 
That is no country for old men, the young in one another's arms. Birds in the trees, it's dactylic, but then slowly it changes, settles down into a kind of iambic meter, but it's never to be taken for granted, and it's often likely to change. That is no country for old men, the young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song. The salmon falls, the mackerel crowded seas, fish, flesh, or fowl, commend or sum along, whatever is begotten, born and dies, caught in that sensual music, all neglect, monuments of an ageing intellect. So, talking about metre, fish, flesh, that's a spondy or two, two stressed syllables together. So, the iambic nature of the metre is never to be taken for granted, and it uh, settles down sometimes into an iambic metre, but always ready to dash off in a different direction, making it seem very modern and uh, very hard to to categorize and get hold of how about so if we're talking about structure it's 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 a very loose iambic pentameter then it the first uh, stanza only really settles down later towards the end but uh, in the other stanzas it becomes more clear that it's iambic pentameter that's to say the pentameter 10 syllables of uh, unstressed, stressed feet, five feet. And uh, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines in each stanza, iambic pentameter, and it's rhyming A, B, A, B, C, D, E, E. So, tree dies. No, it's, it's not actually. It's a half rhyme, so I am wrong. It's, it's A, B, A, B, A, B, C, C. So, A, B, A, B. A, B, C, C. Eight. Eight lines, which rhyme like that. And it finishes with a rhyming couplet. What about the meaning? What about the meaning? Well, Yeats was around 60 when he wrote this poem, so obviously referring to himself that is no country for old men. Which country? Ireland, presumably, or any any country, really. The young in one another's arms. That's the birds and the trees. This is what we expect from poets to be talking about love, but the poet has become an old man, so how can he sing his songs of youth and love as an old man? It's no country for old men, for old poets. The young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song. So the generations are coming and going. They're not thinking about art. They're not thinking about poetry. They're not thinking about creating things that will last for the future. They are just enjoying themselves. They come, they procreate, they die. And the new generation is uh, doing the same thing. Those dying generations at their song. The salmon falls, the mackerel crowded seas. That's a great image, I think. The mackerel crowded seas and the salmon falls. The way that these fish are just packed in the water. And they are... 
the people take them and yet they come and come and come and there are more of them and more of them and they procreate and however many you kill to eat the seas are still full of salmon and full of mackerel and that's how it is with people too just the dying generations at their song they're enjoying themselves they're coming and they're going they don't think about eternal things but they're, they're happy fish flesh or fowl commend all summer long they enjoy themselves all through the summer all through their lives whatever is begotten born and dies caught in that sensual music all neglect monuments of an aging intellect so in this in this world of enjoyment of generations coming and going not interested in questions of art nobody thinks about 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 poems or poetry nobody thinks about monuments of an aging intellect so what should the what should the poet do in those circumstances this is no country for old men what should he do kill himself or or go and live in a cave he's got to do something if he's still alive this is no country for old men and no country for old poets with young people new generations coming and going and enjoying themselves there's more explanation in the second stanza it's it's kind of ruminative he is thinking about about his situation the situation of any old person an aged man is but a paltry thing a tattered coat upon a stick unless soul clap its hands and sing and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress so at least for the artist when he gets older he cannot just become an old man the soul the great soul which has made him a poet has to animate the body has to show him the way so if he is a true poet the soul as he gets older will stay the same or become even better and animate this dying body so an aged man is but a paltry thing a tattered coat upon a stick unless soul clap its hands and sing and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress so so maybe old maybe dying even but the soul is great and the soul of a poet is truly magnificent and it's not really important that that the poet is old it's the soul should reveal him as someone who has something special to offer whatever his age young or old the, the soul of the poet is always special nor is there singing school but studying monuments of its own magnificence so there's no a poet is as they say is born and not made there isn't a place that can teach you how to be a poet maybe people can teach you how to improve as a poet but the actual spark is there from the beginning so there isn't a singing school the poet has to just produce great poems monuments of its own magnificence and so what should he do when he gets old and therefore so he has a great a great soul but he could be dying what's a suitable place for the great soul of a dying poet and therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium 
Well, Byzantium is modern Istanbul before it was conquered by the Turks, of course. It was it was uh, the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. Byzantium, uh, sorry, uh, Constantinople. And before that, it was a Greek colony, colony known as Byzantium. So here, Yeats is using the Greek name, Byzantium. And uh, it was very well known as the center of gold mosaic and building up pictures from mosaic and you can say the development of unusual forms of art which which were, were very uh, precious in a way they they perhaps don't seem to have any point except for except as art so it's it's really the prime example in the western world perhaps of art for art's sake a place where the artist can go and create the perfect artifact anyone who goes to Istanbul now can see the old churches of Constantinople and uh, and these uh, churches of the in these churches the walls are full of these wonderful mosaics <coughs> built up of small pieces of of mosaic pictures made from mosaic and it's it's a particular kind of art form which is uh yeah, it's, it, it takes a long time to learn how to do it, and it's very painstaking to build up the pictures from the small pieces of paneling, and uh, you really have to be dedicated to do that. And as an artist, as a poet, Yeats thinks that this would be a wonderful place for an old poet to go and live his last days in a place where <coughs> they valued art so much and developed really this idea of art for art's sake beyond any the no, any normal point beyond what you can find anywhere else and uh, of course it's it's not really Byzantium or Constantinople or Istanbul that the poet is going to it's a journey in his own mind he he wants to go to a place where they appreciate his art a place where he can write his poems and people will 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 understand what he's doing and appreciate and appreciate it so he thinks that perhaps the best place in his imagination for an old poet to go would be the old city of Byzantium. The next stanza, he begins to think about what will happen to him after his death. Is there survival? And if yes, in what way would he like to survive? What way would the poet like to survive? Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing, but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of ham and gold and gold enamelling to keep a drowsy emperor awake or set upon a gold bow to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. So I have actually... Uh, skipped a verse there because uh, I'm reading it from my computer and as I was reading it I realized that it was the last verse and not the third one so it doesn't really matter the in this final verse he is saying then that once he is out of once he dies 
he wants to actually come back as a perfect artifact. So the perfect piece of art, the perfect poem, the perfect pot, the perfect picture. He wants to be an artistic artifact that can last forever. And he thinks that uh, Byzantium is a perfect place to do that because they were such they were so gifted at these intricate art forms building up pictures on the wall of walls of churches from mosaic once out of nature i shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing but such a form as grecian goldsmiths make lots of greeks working in byzantium of hammered gold and gold enameling. So these are the, this, this beautiful art at Byzantium inspires the poet too to create his beautiful art. And he knows that in this place his poems will be appreciated for all time. And what will they do? Well, the emperor of Byzantium is, a, is a, the great patron of all the arts, so they will keep a drowsy emperor awake. He wants. Yeah, a kind of easy place where people can be awake forever in a sweet unrest, as Keats says. But the art might be so good that it keeps just keeps the emperor awake. Or he could... Uh, it, it, it could keep... It could be something to inspire the lords and ladies of Byzantium and even tell them about the past and the future and the present so it could have a use to maybe maybe the poet can be a prophet also so that's a that's the last stanza the one I missed out actually is my favorite it's a uh, and the transition is from and therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. That's after saying that his home, town and country is no place for old men, no place for old poets. He has to go somewhere where his poetry can live forever, can inspire people. And he thinks the holy city of Byzantium is the right place and now he really goes down deep into his soul in this third stanza which I think is really beautiful O sages standing in God's holy fire as in the gold mosaic of a wall come from the holy fire burn in a gyre and be the singing masters of my soul consume my heart away sick with desire and fastened to a dying animal it knows not what it is and gather me into the artifice of eternity so it's an invocation to the holy priests and artists of Byzantium to come and accept him as somebody who is worthy of spending an eternity in this place, making great artifacts, great art. O sages standing in God's holy fire, as in the gold mosaic of a wall. Come from the holy fire, burn in a gyre, and be the singing masters of my soul. He wants them to come in, in Byzantium, in Istanbul. Now you can go to church and see this, these pictures on the wall made from gold mosaic. And... Uh, the holy wise men of Byzantium. He's asking them to come from the picture in the wall. Take him. Take him. As a student or as someone, perhaps even as an equal, someone who they can they will accept as worthy to exist in Byzantium and write great art and create great art in his case write great poems and uh, they can teach him they can help him they can be the singing masters 
of his soul. He says, Consumed my heart away, sick with desire, and fastened to a dying animal. It knows not what it is, and gather me into the artifice of eternity. So, an old man traditionally should not really feel desire, people think, but actually he is old, but he hasn't changed. He's still full of desire, as perhaps you might expect from a poet. We think of poets as young men, full of desire, writing about love. And he's saying that he may be old, but he hasn't changed. He's still sick with desire. Even though his body is old and decaying and maybe will soon die, sick with desire and fastened to a dying animal. It knows not what it is. And gather me into the artifice of eternity. So he wants to find a place finally where he can call home and create his art, create his artifacts, his great art artifacts, artifacts and artifice coming from artificial it's not natural, it's not trees, it's not nature. Here, Yeats is saying that what is created by the artist is for him the greatest thing of, thing of all. A poem is created from a, po a poet's mind. It's an artifact. It's not a tree, it's not a great, a great view of nature. A picture is created by the artist. A pot is created by the potter. A beautiful picture on the wall is created by the the, the, the the man who can create such mosaics. And that's what he wants. He wants to be in a place which values the artifact, which values art. All these words are related. Art, artificial, artifacts, artifice, something created by man, something artificial, something something that wasn't there through nature. And this is what he values the most. He values his poetry. He values the art of the painter, the art of the of the man who creates the mosaics in the church. That's why he wants to be in this place, because he thinks his art will be valued and he can create it forevermore for the emperor and the lords and ladies of Byzantium to hear. And perhaps in that process, he will even be able to tell them about the past, the present, and the future. When he sings as an artificial golden bird on, on the bough of a tree, so, that, I think, is what the poem is about. And it's an amazing poem for someone to write at the end of his life. Amazing to still have so much desire, to still have so much to say after living so long. And I think this is one of the poems that T.S. Eliot was referring to when he said, or when he claimed that uh, Yeats was the greatest poet of the 20th century, it was really these late poems that he was referring to, and this is one of the best of all. So I hope that this short analysis has been useful, and I apologize for my very bad cold, which means I was speaking through my nose most of the time. Thank you.